Okay, this is CISS 243, Web Database Integration. Um, my name is Mike Zellers. Um, what we're going to do is spend a few minutes to discuss um, the structure of the class, uh, how it's organized in Canvas, the way it will work, and so on. And then we will um, get into the material uh, of the class. Um, I probably know a lot of you people, or I might know you online, uh, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I'm, it's time to take attendance. All right. If you haven't noticed, this class um, with this workstation, uh, I record the classes so that um, they're available. That way, if you miss a class, you can always watch it, or and sometimes I've, I've heard people say, that they've enjoyed the class so much that they want to uh, go back and rewatch the class, like reruns, like their favorite episode of some TV show or something. But it's flattering uh, to do that. But it's available for you, you know. Um, then I use those in my online classes. Uh, one thing people have noted is that on occasion it's difficult to uh, read some of the code up on the board. Um, so I try to remember to make the font bigger on, on stuff. But I also will um, post the, the example, so I'll post the code, so that way you can look at the code uh, while you're watching uh, the lecture. Okay, uh, Brianna Bonnet, Lisa Bursi? Bursal. Bursal. Oh, yeah, that is an L. Jacob Siprich? Daniel Conway? J.P. George? Harrison, Hardenberg, yeah. Yeah. Aaron Howard. Are you uh, are you driving someone? Um, yeah. Through okay. Yeah, I got I got a note from him yesterday saying that my that, that his his new driver is taking my classes. So Matt's a great guy. So yeah. He's cool. yeah. Uh, and a Antonina Kosan. All right. Uh, Nicola Malakar. Yeah. Tyler Mead. Alexandria Navarro, Mila Paris, Mila Paris, David Ramirez, Natalie Salata, Noah Siders, Sitters, Siders, Angela Skinner, Brandon Stevenson, Garrett Sermon, Stephen. Teresi, Matthew Whatmore. I'm going to have to take a little nap after the attendance. This is a big class. Uh, I'm used to a little bit smaller classes, so that's cool. Uh, one thing is that um, there are actually more people that signed up for this class than there are workstations in lab. So a number of people, uh, and a number of people that I added seats to, because I, you know, if someone wants to take the class, I'm not going to stand in their way, uh, committed to using their laptop for the lab. So you're also welcome to use your laptop. Uh, there probably will be like an overflow area for uh, people, because I think our lab's in 202. Um, if there's not enough physical seats, you can go into 212. Uh, the machines in there, however, are really slow. All right. Wow. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, you know, uh, I, I was just, uh, I, I have my Android class in there, and I was playing with it today, and really, it took, what, what takes on my machine a minute, two minutes to fire up the emulator, it took ten minutes, and it wasn't done yet. So, Visual Studio last semester was a bit of a problem in there, too, so, um, anyhow, um, you're encouraged if you have laptops to bring them in. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to start off going over like just general housekeeping stuff uh, about the course and then we'll get into the material. Uh, the material will probably consist of, well, we'll talk about it when we get there. Uh, who just came in? Mila. Mila, okay. All right. This class is a little confusing as far as the times go, just as an FYI. If you do notice, it starts at 10.15, and it goes until, 
I'm not sure when. 12.30, I think. No, no, goes to... 20? Yeah, but when's the lecture done? 10.15 to 11.30, right. And then the lab immediately starts at 11.30 and goes to 12.20. The reason for that is this is actually a four credit hour class, so you get bonus lecture time, all right? Okay, uh, can someone get the lights? I assume you're all familiar with Canvas. If not, I can talk to you about it um, in lab. Um, most of the action in this class is on the modules tab. There will be a module for every week. All right. Uh, the module will include um, anything that I would normally hand out, like as a handout. Uh, it will include um, the lab assignments. Uh, when the videos are recorded and uploaded to YouTube, it will include the videos. So uh, everything pertaining to a week will, will show up in that week's module. So um, start of the semester, I only have week one enabled. Um, sometimes I get a little ahead so I can post like week two while week one's still going on and, and so forth. So um, review that. There is also a module for your semester project, which is down here. And um, I'm just going to introduce that to you today, and I expect you to read it over the next couple of classes because sometime in the near future, <clears throat> within the next few weeks, we will discuss it in class. And it would be great if you've read it by the time that we discuss it. Um, it's never too early to start thinking about uh, your semester project um, and start thinking about what, what you want to do for it. So. Um, the one thing that's amazing to me is I'll have students like agonize about what to do. It's like, come on, just pick something, right? You know, I mean, it, it, you know, just you know, make something up. You know, it's it's really not not uh, uh, earth shattering, and it's better to get as quick a start as you possibly can on it um, uh, to work on it. All right, let's see what else we have. We have. A discussion forum where you can ask questions uh, between classes uh, to the discussion forum. Consider the discussion forum as being like raising your hand and asking a question in class. In other words, if you have a question that you think other people would benefit from hearing the answer to, uh, then ask it in the discussion forum. Um, grades is where you can check your grades. People is if you need to email people. Announcements, I'll post announcements. Um, things such as, what kinds of things do I post in announcements? If I'm not going to be here on a particular day, I'll post it as an announcement as soon as I know. I say that first thing off, that way that will motivate you to check the announcements uh, frequently. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's occasions where someone will ask me a question, uh, or I'll run into difficulty, and, and I don't have an answer for you believe it or not. And, and rather than trying to make something up or give the classic teacher answer for, well, that's up to you to figure out or something like that, uh, what I usually do is I'll take it and work on it and uh, come up with an answer and I'll post the results. Sometimes it's just, you know, all of you have done some programming, I assume. Sometimes it's just a matter of you're missing something really simple and you just need to step away from the problem. And that happens to me just like it happens to everyone else. So if that does happen, what I usually do is I'll post a solution and then post an announcement saying, hey, I have a solution. Or if there's something wrong, if I have a wrong due date on an assignment or something like that, I'll post uh, corrections, uh, additions, uh, things like that. If I get emailed the same question a bunch of times, I might post an announcement on it uh, as well. All right? So uh, it's probably good to check a couple times a week, um, even if you're not, like, turning something in. So, you know, Check between Tuesday and Thursday class, and then check sometime between Thursday and the following Tuesday. If you do that, you should be in good shape. Also, check your email. Um, one thing uh, that I do as far as assignments go, uh, you know, check your grades, and you can view your grades on the grades tab, I think. All right. Uh, the one thing uh, I encourage you to do is check your grades, because in some cases, if you do not do 
uh, an assignment completely correctly, I'll give you partial credit and I'll give you the opportunity to correct it for, for full credit. All right. So, uh, but you're not going to know that if you don't check your grades. Uh, my goal is always to have things graded within a week of their original due date. Um, but again, sometimes when the semester gets busy, I fall a little bit behind. Uh, I, every semester, that's, that's one of the things I feel I need to work on, and, and I hope this semester I do uh, a real good job uh, keeping up to date with the grading. All right, let's look at the syllabus. I'm not going to read every line uh, of the syllabus to you, even though it's great fun when the teacher reads everything to you on screen. I'm going to avoid doing that. Um, and I'm going to summarize and hit the high points and sort of give my commentary on it instead. The main pop, pop, uh, purpose for the top part is to show you that there's a lot of ways that you can get a hold of me. All right. One thing I try to stress in this class is uh, encourage you to ask questions. Ask questions why, uh, you know, if you don't understand something or if something doesn't sound right to you or you're not sure what I mean or whatever. All right. Um, and you can ask questions a variety of different ways. You can ask questions um, to me uh, in class, certainly. You know, if there's something I say and you don't really understand it, or you didn't hear me, or you can't see what's on the board, or whatever, just ask, you know, and, and I'll be glad to clarify it for you. You can also ask questions during lab, so that's one good thing about the lab time, is that it's set up uh, for you to ask questions um, um, that, that you might have. Uh, you can also email me, and you can email me either at my Lorraine CCC address, or you can email me via <laughs> Canvas. Uh, probably better to email me through Canvas, but, you know, you could also email me at my regular email address. And I, I do a pretty good job responding to email. I will say, this is something that I probably should put in the syllabus. Uh, I'm just thinking about it now. But if you have a problem with an assignment, send me an email about it, as opposed to turning it in and asking the question there. All right. The assumption sort of is, is that when you turn in the assignment that it's your best shot at it and you think it's right. All right. Uh, if you're working on an assignment and you have a question about it, it's better to email it to me, the question, uh, than to uh, turn it in and include the question there. All right. Because I try to answer my email daily. So hopefully, you know, you won't go more than a day or so without getting a response on an email question. Whereas grading, I do periodically. I might only do grading once a week, all right? So therefore, you might have to wait a week for a response. So email if you have questions uh, about an assignment, if you're not sure. Uh, other ways to get a hold of me. I have office hours. I haven't decided what those office hours are yet, but I will have them at some point. Um, we can talk. Uh, on the office, uh, during the office hours, we can talk, meet in person. You can come to my office. You can uh, uh, call me in Skype uh, on the phone or over Skype or online chat. Um, you can come to one of, them, one of my other lab sessions. All right. I have a lab um, Tuesday and Thursday evening. I have a lab uh, Monday uh, during the day, uh, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So you can come to my other labs if you have questions. So there's a lot of ways for you to ask questions. And if all of those fail, you can always talk to me and we can arrange something else. So I try to make myself as accessible as possible. So any way that you have a question, you're able to, there's an opportunity for you to get it answered. All right? So that's the point of all of this. Maybe it would have been better if I read to you every word. It would have taken less time. But I, I want to point out why I'm telling you all these different techniques, all right? Um, Here's a description of the course. The, I mean, these are the kinds of things that we have to do, like for our catalog and, and so on, uh, when we define a course. But they're important to keep in your mind as to why we're here, what the main goals are of this class. There's no text for this class. Um, therefore, I will try to post materials to Canvas. And if you do have questions and you, if you would work better with a book, 
Um, there's a nice service called Safari Books Online that's available through our library that you could go and you can look up and you can see full text version of books. Uh, if you're on campus, you're automatically connected to it. If you are off campus, you have to put in your library card number. All right. And you can find books about the topics that we talk about in class um, that way if you need additional help. Plus, there's a lot of resources available on the web. Instructor's approach, this is your class. That's the one sentence I will read verbatim. All right. Uh, it doesn't do me any good to, to, quote, cover the material if people aren't getting it. So, you know, I may have goals for the week of covering certain concepts or whatever, but if you're not getting it, there's no sense of me going on just so I can check it off my list and say, yeah, I covered it. All right, so therefore, ask the questions. And I want to make sure the stuff I cover you do understand. All right, um, collectively and individually. So um, in order for that to work, I need your feedback. All right, it's difficult for me to tell uh, just by looking. Um, sometimes I can see people seem to look confused, but you know maybe they're confused about they're not sure where they're going to go for lunch today. You know, I don't know. All right, so you have to meet me halfway, and you have to let me know when you have questions and and when you need additional help. There's a number of college policies that you should take a look at. Instructors' policies for late work. I'm probably more flexible than most instructors about late work because I want you to get the assignments done and I want you to get the assignments done well. I don't want you rushing just to turn something in. All right. Uh, I recognize that everyone has a lot of other responsibilities in their lives. Right. You know, a lot of you are working or have families or or whatever. Plus, unusual circumstances. You might become ill or or whatever. All right. So therefore, I understand if you're late with an assignment. As long as you keep me in the loop. What do I mean by keeping me in the loop? I mean letting me know. You don't have to go into your family history, but if you have a situation you need to, you need to take care of, you can say, hey, I have a situation I need to take care of. Um, I'm going to be late with this assignment. No problem. If you don't understand the material, ask me questions. If I see you in lab asking me questions and I get emails from you, um, and we're in communication about it, if the lab is turned in a day or two late, it really doesn't matter that much to me, all right, in the grand scheme of things. I'm most interested in what you get out of this class when you leave this class. And if you miss some of the deadlines along the way, hey, as long as you catch up by the end, that's great. Now, the one thing I will say is that some students use this as a crutch, and I strongly advise against that because uh, if you're late on one assignment because you were ill, so you turn something in a couple days late, that's no problem. If you're continually late with every assignment, though, that's a signal that something needs to change. All right? Something needs to change. You need to talk to me about the confusion. You need to devote more time to the class. Whatever. But something needs to change if you are late on every single assignment. All right. Incompletes, I, I generally only uh, give incompletes in the case of extenuating circumstances. For example, like the, the entire week that the project is due, you uh, were hospitalized or something like that and can't possibly finish in time. An incomplete is simply an extension of the semester that allows you to, to finish things up late. You'll have... Uh, your final grade will be based on your grades and based on the following activities. There will be 30 points for the project and 70 points for the homework. That's 100%. Now, on occasion, the, the homework assignments might not add up to exactly 70 points. You know, sometimes there's 72 points or sometimes there's 68 points or something like that. It's like plus or minus a few points. I'll prorate them to be 70 points by simply multiplying by whatever I need to to make it 70 points, all right? Um, so you don't have to worry about, you know, um, what if we're a little low or a little high on points. We, we even that out by prorating it. The project is, do is done in two segments. There's a design, 
where you plan out what you're going to do, and then there's actually the final project where you actually execute the plan and come up with a, a working website. So the, the, the plan is done, uh, or the project is done in two parts. So those two parts together add up to be 30 points. I forget what the, I think it's like, I think it's like 10 and 20, 10 for the design, 20 for the finished product, something like that. And then 90, 80, 70, 60 for your A's, B's, C's, and so on. All right, any questions about any of this? Any questions about um, any of this sort of material, sort of the how the class is going to be run? If any of you have had me in other classes, you probably know I, I, I make every effort to run all my classes pretty much the same way, you know, as far as policies and, and stuff like that. All right. Well, we can have the lights again. Um, I want to talk about two concepts. This is important to, to understand. Uh, two concepts as far as web pages go. Typically, we could describe web pages as either being static or dynamic. All right. What's the difference? What do these words mean? What's a static website act like? What's a dynamic website act like? Yes. I think one's just text and one is a form. Or something. One is text, one is a form. That might be a good sign that one is static and one is dynamic because a form means that the user can enter some information and the website hopefully will do something with that information. All right, so that's definitely on the right track. Yes? Static stays the same and dynamic can change depending on users. All right. At the simplest form, the word static means unchanging. Or the word dynamic means changing. Changing based on what? Can change based on user. can change based on your location, can change based on the time of day. It can change based on some other external events. When we say static is unchanging, it means that it is unchanging unless someone manually goes in and changes the code. So if you think about the web pages that you developed, uh, if you took CISS 216, the intro to web development, if you still have those and you brought up those pages, with almost no exceptions, those pages would, would look exactly the same today as the day that you turned them in. All right? Um, you created them, you saved them. You created the HTML form, you created the CSS, and maybe created some JavaScript. But the point is, is that if you look at the content of that page, it's going to be identical today as the day that you turned it in. If you want to change it, you have to manually go and change it. These pages are coded in HTML with CSS and maybe with some JavaScript as well. Can anyone think of an example of a dynamic web page or website? Amazon. Amazon? Okay. Another example? Uh, ESPN. ESPN? Yeah, weather. Weather? All right. All those are good examples, and we'll talk about different ways that a website can be dynamic. All right, but all those are great examples. What do you think there are more of on the web? Static pages or dynamic pages? <laughs> dynamic. Static pages are really, really rare. All right? The only kind of page I 
would think uh, that a, a uh, static page would be for is maybe for a very small business where their information doesn't change much and they just want to have some information, some web presence. Like maybe a restaurant, a small family diner, right? They might have uh, their location on it, they may have their menu on it, they may have their hours on it, um, maybe a couple <laughs> other things. Yes? Maybe government entities, right? You know, they have every four years when they get a new mayor, someone goes in and changes a page, all right? Um, but typically small, where the, the business doesn't really change. Now, if you're talking about a larger restaurant, you can still have a dynamic website, right? Because they may take reservations on it. They may... Um, may have a rotating menu where there's specials on different days and so on and so on and so forth. All right? Let's pull up a couple of web pages and let's talk about how they are dynamic because we listed a couple different ways that a website can be dynamic. We talked about can be dynamic based on user, can be dynamic based on location, can be dynamic based on the time of day or the day of the week it is can be dynamic based on uh, certain external events. So let's go and let's put up some dynamic pages. And the first of which is Canvas. How can I make the statement that Canvas is a dynamic website? How do I know that? Yes? Because it changes based on the student. Because it changes based on the person that's logged in. All right? So, for example, I go and I, pre I type in my username and password. And as, as you alluded to earlier, the fact that there's a form on the website is kind of a tip-off that there probably is some dynamic stuff working on. Because chances are there's a form there so that the server can take and do something with that form to make the page look different. So in this case, if I type in my user ID and password, I get a page made just for me. All right? CISS 115. CISS 115. From spring 2017. Don't ask. It's a long story. But... All right. Uh, here's some more exciting classes for me. Uh, all my fall 2017 classes. CISS 216, CISS 226, 232, 243, and so on. So this shows the list of classes that I'm in, uh, I have something to do with. All right. If you log in, you'll see a different set of classes. You'll see the classes that you were enrolled in. It gets even more extensive than that. For example, I can grade stuff. You can't grade stuff, all right? So we have different permissions, and we can access different things on the site based on um, the role that we perform in a class. Now, uh, I've taken classes out here. I've enrolled in classes as a student. Now, it's smart enough to know that the classes I teach I can grade. The classes I'm enrolled in as a student I can't grade in. Uh, you know, I can't grade my own work, all right? Yeah. Uh, I can see everyone's grades. You can only see your own grades. There's a lot of differences just based on who you are and more so, and in addition to who you are, the role that you perform in this particular class. Now, let's think about it for a second. Obviously, this couldn't be static pages, right? They could not possibly have a web page coded in HTML for every single student that's enrolled here at LC, all right? That logistically, that would be a nightmare. It would be totally impractical, Indeed. all right? And therefore, something else has to be going on here, something other than plain old HTML. And we'll talk about what that something else is in, in a couple minutes here. All right. Another example of a dynamic site. Google. Uh, yes. Google. All right. So 
is accepting data and it's going to probably do something with that data. I type in Italian restaurant. And it will show me restaurants, but notice it shows me restaurants near where I am. All right, it shows me a restaurant in North Ridgeville. <coughs> Ten best Italian restaurants in Lorraine. The map shows me Olive Garden, Angelina's, Uncle Al's, and so on down the line. Stuff at the Midway Mall. Now, that's sort of an indication to you that it knows where we are. And in fact, it actually asked me if, if, if I would tell it where I was to give an even more precise location. But even if you don't allow it to get a more precise location, it has some idea of where you are. And it can customize your results based on that location. So it isn't always based on user. All right? It isn't always based on user. All right? It can be based on things such as location. In a case like this, if I was in New York, for example, and I were to do the same search, I would get restaurants in New York. If it was in Chicago, I'd get restaurants in Chicago, and so on. Now again, if you think about it, could Google possibly have a pre-written HTML page ready for every possible search term that people could search for, along with every possible search term that people could look for from every possible location. Just not practical. So Google has something else. All right? And we'll talk about what that is uh, in a couple minutes here. We can think of more uh, things. If I was, for example, going to pick a TV network, let's uh, type in HBO. Okay, HBO. I go and look and I can see, notice that up here is a show that is on Tuesdays. Hard not. Tonight on HBO, it shows a list of things that are on Tuesday evening. So, if I were to go, if we were going to look at this on Thursday, if we went back and looked at, at the same page on Thursday, presumably it would have something else. It would have a show that's on <laughs> Thursday evenings, or have a list of Thursday evenings. It might even be smart enough. Um, well, it is. If you notice real small here, it's showing me that it's Eastern Time. So it's smart enough to know that I'm in Eastern Time Zone. So this page is dynamic, both on the day and time that it is, um, and location of where I am. All right? eBay. Um, if we look for something, uh, what should we look for? I'll tell you what. We'll look for some we'll look for a tuxedo. Yeah. Current bid is $40. Let's say I go in and I bid $45 for it. All right? The next person that goes and looks at this, what are they going to see as a price? $45. All right? Now, do you think when I place a bid that someone at eBay headquarters is rushing to finding the HTML file for this and so that they can go and manually change it to be $40 to $45? Of course not. That, that doesn't make any sense. So obviously something more has to be going on here. All right? And that's what we're going to talk about now. How can these sites do this sort of thing? Right? Because HTML by itself is static. If you look at the HTML you developed in CISS 216, your pages are going to look identical today as they did when you turned them in, unless you went back and manually changed them. Whereas these pages obviously are going to look different 
if different people view them, if people view them from a different location, if you view them today versus tomorrow, they're all going to look different. All right, how does that work? Let's start by talking about the way static pages work. And let's establish a couple of terms here and talk about the way static pages work. This is a diagram I'll probably draw a million times in this class. And if you take other classes from me, I'll probably draw it a million more times in those classes. We have a client. What do I mean by a client? The simplest example is someone that is using a web browser to browse the web. All right? They are visiting your website and other people's websites. They are making requests through the internet for a particular web page and they're getting a response back. All right? Those are two key words, request and response. Clients make requests of servers. Servers respond to clients. That's true for all kinds of servers, by the way, because we're going to be talking about web servers in this class, but there's other kinds of servers, servers too. For example, database servers, or file servers, or FTP servers, or whatever. And there's clients as well. And while the specific function might be different, the notion of a client server is a client is what's making the request, the server is what is responding. So, the client is connected up somehow to the internet. And we draw it like a cloud because we don't really care about the details of how stuff travels around the internet. All right? That, you study that probably in some networking class. All right? We don't really care. All we care about is that if you make a request for a server, somehow that request gets to the server that you want it to. So if I type, and how do I make a request? Well, one way I can make a request is by typing in the address. So I can type in www.ebay.com. There's all kinds of things that happen in the internet. They look up the domain name, www.ebay.com. They get the IP address for it. You actually bounce around to several different places on the web. And finally, your request makes it to the web server at ebay.com. And the web server responds to you. So a client makes requests and the server responds. Now let's say we have a static web page, a web page for a restaurant, mom and pop diner, hasn't changed since 1974, you know, it still has the same sign, it still has the same booth, it still has the same carpet, it still has the same menu, alright? In the case of a static page, you have completed HTML files. along with CSS and so on. If I request a static web page, the web server's job is easy. All it does is it finds the page that I've asked for and it delivers it to the client. So the client then has that page in their web browser and they can view it. So, the web server will respond to the client with the static HTML page, which will be a combination of HTML, CSS, and maybe some JavaScript, along with all the other files, the images, and so on. And then the user views it in their browser. If you clicked another link, if you're on the home page for the restaurant, you click the menu link, you would make another request to the server for a different page. So typing in an address, clicking a link, those are all ways that you request a page from a server. 
And the server, in the case of static pages, simply finds the HTML code that's already been written and is sitting out there and delivers it to the client. All right? Keep in mind that client can be a lot of different stuff, right? The, 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 the main one that we usually think of is someone sitting in a computer typing it in, typing in and clicking links and so on. But it could be other things, too. It could be someone using a mobile device to access the web. <clears throat> it could be a search engine that crawls the web and indexes uh, the web, like Google has. You know, If you create a new web page, pretty soon Google's going to know about it. right? And if you search for something, you're going to find it. All right? That's static pages. The analogy I give, I almost always give food analogies. All right? But the analogy that I give here is this is like ordering a sandwich at McDonald's. All right? For the most part, you go in and order a sandwich at McDonald's. What does the server do? The server simply finds the thing that you ordered, finds the bin where there is the Big Mac or fish sandwich or whatever else McDonald's has, and they grab one and they give it to you. All right? So it's been made. It's sitting there waiting for you. You order it. The server finds it and delivers it to you. All right? And in the case of web pages, we're not talking about sandwiches. We're talking about HTML code, CSS code, JavaScript code, and so on. I'll probably just, to, to shorthand, I'll say an HTML file, knowing that it can contain this other stuff too. All right? Now, let's talk about how dynamic pages work. With dynamic pages, you still have the same sort of thing, right? The user makes a request, all right? How can a user make a request? In the same way they make a request for a static page. You type something in, you press a link, you press a submit button to submit a form data. Those are all ways of making requests, all right? But with dynamic pages, those requests are a little more involved. All right? Actually, some of these things are true for static pages as well, but static pages just don't really worry about the additional information that comes with the request. Because so far when I talked about making a request, when I talked about static pages, really the only thing that's important is the URL the address of the page that you're requesting. Because that's all the server needs to respond back and give you the appropriate page if we're talking about a static page. That's it. All you need to say is, hey, I want menu.html from mom and pop's diner. And it'll give it to you. That's the only thing that the server considers. With static pages, though, there's more information that is sent. All right? And actually, it's sent all the time, but with dynamic pages, that information comes into play. What are some of the pieces of information that come over when you make a request? Well, the URL still comes over. You know, if I type in my user ID and password, for example, in Canvas, let's talk about that to start out. All right? And I hit log on button. Hitting the button makes a request. So it not only has an address. Remember when you did forms in, in CISS 216, there was an action and a method. Well, what was the action? It was the name of the URL that you wanted to call on the server. All right. So you give the URL as part of the request. You also give all the form data. In this case, the user ID and the password. You also give other data as well. You give your IP address. Can someone define what an IP address is? Yes. The address of the actual yeah, it's a number that is the address of the, the computer that's making a request. Every machine on the internet has an IP address, and they're unique. 
right? Which makes sense, right? Because if I Google something, I'm going to get the results, not someone else. So the just like uh, you know, in in a city, you know, the the addresses are unique. You know, there's not two things that have share the exact same address. It's a little bit different. All right. Um, you want to make sure you send the results back to whoever requested it, right? So the IP address is the mechanism by which that happens and, and that you make sure that you get the response for what you asked for. Now, the IP address doesn't give a precise location, but you can use it to get an approximate location. And how do you do that? Because each ISP gets their own set of IP addresses to use, right? This has to be controlled because there can't be two, du you know, there can't be duplicate IP addresses because then you wouldn't know who gets what, all right? So the one way that it's controlled is each internet service provider has a unique set of IP addresses that they can use, all right? And typically that ISP is associated with an approximate geographical location. So for example, if I brought up Google Maps right now and I asked for my location on this machine, it would show someplace in Elyria. It wouldn't show Lorraine Community College, it would show someplace in Elyria because the, I, the internet service provider for this college is somewhere in Elyria, all right? Um, I've had cases where, um, for whatever reason, uh, back in the, back years ago, when I uh, had my internet service provider through Century, all right, telephone. Century Telephone, I think their headquarters is in Louisiana or something like that. Well, my location would show Louisiana, because probably what they did is they would they assigned or reassigned IP addresses to different branch offices, and somehow I got assigned to Louisiana. All right, so it's not always going to be accurate. All right, now, uh, sort of as an aside, uh, another thing that you can do uh, with devices that are GPS enabled is you can actually give your actual physical location. So, for example, if I had a mobile phone. I could, uh, the server could uh, access not just uh, an approximate location of my internet service provider, but could, it could access like my actual precise location. One thing we do in uh, mobile uh, web development class is we actually create like a little campus map. And as we walk around campus, we can actually see the little dot moving saying, okay, you're now by the ILOF building, okay, you walk that way, you're closer to the college center now. You can actually see it moving as you're walking on a web page, all right? But that would require a, uh, a mobile device that's GPS enabled, and that would require uh, you giving consent to, to providing that information to the web server. But at any rate, that's another thing that comes over as part of the request, the IP address. So, the IP address, the user information, the platform that you're on. In other words, are you on a mobile device, a computer, the operating system? Are you on Android, iOS, um, Windows, uh, OS 10 for Macintosh or whatever? and other information, the kind of browser you're using. Sometimes if you go to a site to download software, for example, it'll be smart enough to give you the download link for your platform. So if I wanted to download um, something that's available both on Mac and Windows, if I visited it from my Mac laptop, the link that says download this app would download the Mac version of it as opposed to the Windows version of it. How does it do that? Because the server knows what platform that you're on.
the date and time, and a whole and some other stuff that's probably less relevant uh, to this. So let's look at all the examples, and let's figure out what in the request tipped off the server to do its thing. All right. Well, Canvas, it was the form data, right? The user ID and password was what was relevant. All right. It, the server took that and somehow used it to create a web page just for me. In the case of Google, there's actually a whole bunch of factors involved. What I typed in the search bar, what I typed in the form is one. My location is another. It probably also considers my platform. In other words, I don't think platform is relevant for Italian restaurants unless Mac users like a certain kind of Italian food and Windows users like another kind, but that's probably not likely. But if I was Googling software, you bet that's relevant. If I was Googling for some uh, audio processing software, all right, it matters whether I'm on a Mac or a, a Windows machine. And therefore, Google is likely to consider that when it forms the search results uh, for me. eBay, we're not really ready to answer that one yet. No. All right, we'll answer that in a minute. OK, so all this information comes to the server in the form of a, a request. So the web server has all this information. Again, in the case of static data, all it needs is the URL, in the case of a static web page. In the case of a dynamic web page, though, the server doesn't have completed HTML files. It has generically what we can call server-side scripts. What is a script? What's another name for script? SQL coding? Well, some kind of coding. All right. It might include SQL coding. It might include coding in C sharp. Depending on the particular website, it could be coding in PHP. All right. When you see scripting, it's programming. So in the case of server-side scripts, it could be done with ASP.NET and C sharp. Could be done in PHP. Could be done in Python. Could be done on Rube in Ruby. JSP. There's a whole list of things that could be done on. Alright? All of these work the same. All of these, the concepts are the same for. In our class, we're going to be using ASP.NET and C sharp. Alright? But these scripts are little are programs that take all this request information it takes all this request information and here's the kicker it might also interact with a database all right now, I'm showing it directly interacting with a database. In reality, I should probably draw a little server in here, because it actually goes to a little database server to interact with the database. So let's, let's, let's trace through our Canvas login. I go, I request the Canvas home page. That comes back to me. That may very well be static HTML, because the home page is probably the same for just about everyone. Could be static HTML. I type in my username and password, all right, and I click Submit. That makes a request. It sends it to a URL on the Canvas server, and it gives me, and it also passes the username and password that I typed in on the form. These scripts go to work. The script is loaded, the program is loaded, goes to work, and it interacts with the database to see 
what classes I'm enrolled in, all right, um, what role my class is, and it creates an HTML page, all right. So here's a real key point. Both static and dynamic pages come back to the client as HTML pages. It's just the difference is how is it created. With static pages, you have completed HTML pages out there waiting. All right, they're just sitting there waiting for requests to be delivered. Just like in the case of McDonald's, there's sandwiches in the bins waiting to be delivered to someone that comes in and orders them. Yeah. In the case of server-side scripts, you don't have a completed page, you have a recipe for a page. You have a program to create a page. You have a script to create a page. And that script is going to get pieces of data that it needs to finish its job from a couple different places. Some of that information is going to get from the request. So when I log in, I'm going to get the, the, the data that I entered in on the form. That comes through with the request. The specifics about what classes that that user is enrolled in, or if that's even a valid username and password, it's going to get from the database. So it brings everything together, and the end result is that program's output is an HTML page. Why? Because that's what browsers understand. That's what browsers need the response to be. The response needs to be a web page. Because that's what browsers understand. Browsers don't understand ASP.NET code, or C Sharp code, or SQL code. Browsers don't understand those. So if you gave that code to the browser, the browser wouldn't know what to do with it. Browsers don't understand PHP or Python. They understand HTML. So when the day is done and the processing is completed, both these methods return or respond back to the client with an HTML page. That consists of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. The difference is, is this is like McDonald's. This is like Subway. All right, told you we'd go back to a food analogy. All right. Yeah. What happens when you go in the subway? All right. You go in the subway. Do they have a bin with every possible sandwich that you could possibly order? All right. A turkey club on white bread. A turkey club on wheat bread. Turkey club on white bread with mayo. Turkey club on wheat bread with mayo. And so that's absurd. They couldn't possibly have all the combinations. What do they have? They have a server who has a recipe in their mind. They know how to make a turkey club sandwich. All right? Yeah. Where do they get the rest of the information, though? They get it from the user. They get it from you, the client. So you come in and say, I want a turkey club with mayo and lettuce and uh, provolone cheese. All right? So what does the <coughs> person do? Well, they have the recipe out ahead of how to make a turkey club. They go, they assemble all the ingredients together, and when they're done, they hand you a sandwich. So if you walk out of Subway or you walk out of McDonald's, you have a sandwich. Because that's what a hungry customer wants, right? It's a sandwich. A hungry customer can't do anything with the recipe. All right? You're not going to eat the recipe. You are going to eat the sandwich, however. Same idea here. The client, which is running a web browser, doesn't eat, but it consumes, if you will, web pages. It needs web pages. Those web pages can be created one of two ways. One is they can be completed web pages waiting to be delivered, and they just get delivered to the user. The second possibility is there can be a little program whose job it is to write that web page every time it happens. Now, coming back to eBay, all right? I go and I bid $45 on that fine tuxedo, all right? Next person comes in and looks at it. They see a price of $45. Why is that? Because between the time I looked at it and the time this next person looked at it, my bid got stored in the database. So my bid of $45 got put 
makes a request to view that item, that page is made for them on the fly at that moment in time, which means that it is looking at the highest bid as of a microsecond before the time the person that made that request. And therefore, they will see the higher bid of $45. All right? So another thing about dynamic pages that we haven't talked about yet, in addition to inquiring from a database, dynamic pages can also update databases. So for example, if I placed a bid on eBay, uh, it's going in and it's going to take the value I put in the form and actually put it into the database. That's why those little arrows go in both directions. Because it's not only inquiring data from the database, it can be used to update the database. All right, these are important to understand because our job now is going to be to use ASP.NET stuff to create server-side scripts to create web pages. Now, you have to know HTML to do this, right? Because you have to know what the end result needs to look like in order to create the proper ASP.NET and C-sharp code to get the web page that you want. All right, so it's sort of bumping things up a level. You're not going to be writing, in this class, HTML pages for the most part. You're going to be writing dynamic pages, which are programs to produce HTML pages. All right, there's a couple terms I want to talk about sort of to close out class today, and we'll talk about the first lab that's due. I want to talk about, first of all, ASP.NET. C-sharp, and Visual Studio. Then we'll take a two-minute tour of Visual Studio. I imagine you probably all have used it. We're going to show you how we're going to use it in this class. All right. All right. How would you define ASP.NET? What's a good definition of ASP.NET? Framework. Framework. All right, good answer. What do I mean by a framework? What, what do you think of when you hear the word framework? If I was going to give you a frame for a garage. A structure. A structure. Something specifically a structure that you build upon. So ASP.NET is a framework. So it is. It gives you building blocks to create an application that you want to. All right? So there's a whole bunch of things in ASP.NET that allow you to do things quicker and more easily than if you were doing everything from scratch. All right? That's sort of the key thing when we talk about software and a framework. All right? That it gives you components that you can use to build up something uh, without having to do everything from scratch. So ASP.NET is a framework. It's a bunch of controls, or classes, might be another way to say it. But still another way to say it would be building blocks. That you can put together to build your application. So you don't have to do everything from scratch. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. All right? What is C-sharp? It's a programming language. Yeah, programming language. And specifically, it's a programming language that we use in conjunction with the ASP.NET control to access, manipulate, manipulate, and process the stuff that's in these ASP.NET controls. This will become more clear when we go through an example of this, which should happen on, on Thursday. Right. What is Visual Studio? IDE. An IDE. IDE. What, what does IDE mean? Interactive Development, development and 
environment. Yeah, it, uh, uh, integrated development environment. Yeah. All right, it's the tool that you use to make a dynamic web page using ASP.NET and C Sharp. So your first assignment is pretty simple. It, it isn't required to create a dynamic page yet. It's a static page. I talk about um, Oh, let me look it up. I don't remember what I talked about. <laughs> okay. Create a web page as an overview of the main topics of this course. The main topics are as follows. ASP.NET, database design, and SQL. So it doesn't matter if you don't know what these are. You're going to look it up and you're going to do some research and find out what these are. And you create a web page that gives an overview for these three topics. So find information about the topics, what it means, how they're used. Find some pages that will help you with this topic. Have two references and two resources. Don't worry about the difference between a reference and a resource. It was clear in my mind when I wrote this. Now I'm not really sure what the difference is. So just have four links about those topics. And then with Visual Studio, create an ASP.NET web application that contains a page with the above information. So let's see how we're going to do that. All right? And again, you can practice this in lab today. Cool. I'm going to go to Visual Studio. I'm going to go to File, New, Website. Now, you may have done it in different ways. This is the way that seems to work best um, that I've experienced for what we're doing in this class. File new website. Click that. It will ask you some information. Pick that you want to create an empty website. Pick where you want to store that website. I'm going to store it on the desktop. And I'm going to give it the name of example one. It asks me if you want to create the folder. Sure. Under templates, pick C sharp. So empty website, visual C sharp the folder that you want to create it. I'm going to click OK. It's going to go and it's going to make some things. It's going to make a folder that has one file in it, the web config file. If I go out on the desktop, I can see that folder with the web config file. Actually, web config and web debug config. We'll talk about those later. Every web application needs a web config file. So how do I make a web page? Uh, I'm going to go up and I'm going to say file, new, file. Then I'm going to pick not HTML page. I'm going to pick web form. I'm going to make sure this is checked. Place code in a separate file. Make sure C sharp is uh, selected. Click add. Okay. And then I get the shell of an HTML 
page that I can create. Now, you can type in the code just like you typed in in CISS 216. The advantage, of course, is there's IntelliSense. So if I type in H, it will show me all the H tags that exist. So I could type in H1 and so on. I can create style sheet to go along with this by going up to saying File, New, File, Style Sheet and add, and I can put my style sheet code. Then I can go back in this page and I can link it. I'm just going to put the word hello in here. Hello. And I click run. And it's going to pull up the browser and it's going to show my HTML code. Now there's nothing dynamic about this, but we're going to position ourselves to make an easy transition to creating dynamic pages with our next lab. Now at the end of the day if I go home I will want to take the folder that contains the application. How do I know the folder that contains the application? Because it will can be the one that contains a web config file in any of the files that I created. <coughs> How do I open that up again? Well, I go into Visual Studio. Instead of saying new website, I say open website. And I pick the folder that contains the web config file. All right. I'll probably say that a hundred times because sometimes students get confused about what they need to send me. <coughs> You need to send me the folder that contains the web config file. So you need to zip that up, compress it, and send it to me. So I can click on open, and then I'm back to where I was before, and I can continue editing the stuff that was in there. So your first assignment is to create a static web page, but to do it this way. So at least you begin getting familiar with uh, the use of Visual Studio. Next time we'll talk more about the dynamic aspect and we'll create some dynamic pages that do some stuff. All right? Okay. Oh. We'll see you in lab. Uh, yes, go ahead. What version of Visual Studio? Uh, this is 2015. Uh, what's most important isn't the version of Visual Studio, but the uh, version of the framework that you use. I think this was using 4.5.2. It shouldn't be a problem because I can open older versions if you have it. It would be a good idea, although there is Visual Studio installed here, it would be a good idea to install it uh, on your machine at home as well.